Welcome to Lecture 8. So far in this course, we've talked about kind of the core ideas in deep learning. Convolutions, backpropagation, the basics of optimization, and so forth. In today's lecture will focus more on applications. Today, we're going to discuss how deep learning methods can be applied to a number of widely studied problems in computer vision in particular. As a result, the lecture will be divided into several parts studying different computer vision problems. It'll be a little bit more high level than the lectures uh, up until now, but for each section I will also reference some uh, prominent research papers that you can look at if you want to get more detail about how some of this stuff works. All right, um, so let's get started. So far, when we've discussed convolutional neural networks, we've discussed networks that can map an image to a single output value, which so far has been a categorical variable representing a class, uh, basically the, the, the semantic category of the object that's in an image, like a bicycle, a cat, or a dog. Uh, this is a very widely studied problem in computer vision and also in deep learning. This is the classification problem. And part of why this, it makes a lot of sense to start with is that it, it provides us with a kind of a very general way to introduce basic deep learning concepts. But if we actually want to solve computer vision problems, there may be other problem settings that we're concerned with besides just classification. For example, if you would like your autonomous car to be able to figure out where other objects are on the road, you don't just want to classify whether a pedestrian or a pothole is present, you want to actually figure out where they are in the image. You might even want a more fine-grained uh, detector. You might want to know for each pixel in the image which object is present at that location. These problems don't fit neatly into the kind of classification paradigm that we discussed before, but they can be attacked with deep learning methods with a little bit of effort. So the standard computer vision problems that we'll discuss in today's lecture are going to be the following. Uh, we have object classification, which we've talked about already, so I won't dwell on this, but a lot of the uh, methodology that we'll see for the other problems is based off of the ideas we introduced for object classification. Uh, but stated formally, the problem of object classification refers to outputting a categorical variable, meaning a discrete variable, indicating what type of object is present in the image. Now, this problem setting, if we think about it a little bit, is a little strange because not only uh, do we have to output a single label for the image, we do so without any regard for where the object is present. So in some cases, this is pretty obvious. So if you see a photograph of a tree with nothing else around it, uh, then you know the class is a tree. But if you see a photograph that contains maybe a tree in one corner and a flower in another corner, do you call that a tree? Do you call that a flower? You're forced to commit to only one thing. Uh, and sometimes this doesn't entirely comport with how the world actually works. A slightly more nuanced computer vision problem is the problem of object localization, or more commonly, simultaneous classification and localization. Uh, so this still de deals with a setting where there's one object, and the goal for the model is to output what that object is and where it is. And the way that we specify where is typically with a bounding box, an axis-aligned rectangle that has an xy position, a width, and a height. Now, this is a little bit arbitrary because, of course, real objects are not boxes. Uh, real objects have shape, they have orientation, but for the sake of simplicity, a commonly used representation in computer vision is a bounding box, which is just an xy position in the image, a width, and a height. A somewhat more sophisticated problem setting is object detection, which is similar to object localization, only it handles the combinatorial nature of the world. The goal in object detection is to output bounding boxes for every object that you know how to recognize in the image. So you're still given a list of classes, just like an object classification, but now instead of predicting one class and one bounding box for each image, you have to actually predict many classes and many bounding boxes for each image corresponding to all the objects that are present. In some sense, this problem setting actually makes a lot more sense because it actually reflects the fact that the real world really is combinatorial, and in most images there are many objects that are present. We can take this idea even further uh, and develop what is sometimes referred to as semantic segmentation or scene understanding. This is the problem of not just outputting a bounding box for every object that is present in the image, but in fact labeling every single pixel in, that, in the image 
with the semantic category of the object located at that pixel. And uh, while the object detection problem statement might not account for the particular shape uh, of the objects, the semantic segmentation problem statement does account for this. So in today's lecture, we'll talk about object localization, then detection, and then semantic segmentation in that order, going from kind of least detail to most detail. All right, so let's talk about object localization because that one is you know, fairly straightforward and it fits a little more neatly uh, into the uh, paradigms that we discussed so far, and then we'll extend that to do object detection. So before, when we did regular classification, our data set consisted of uh, tuples xi, yi, where xi is the ith image in the data set, and yi is the ith label, which is a categorical variable. Now, we're still going to have a data set of xi, yi tuples, but y, yi is now more complex. Yi is now itself a little list uh, consisting of the label li, the x and y position of the bounding box, and the width and height of the bounding box. So the image is an array of pixels. The corresponding label for that image contains five things, the semantic category, cat, dog, a bus, or bicycle, the x and y position of its bounding box, and the width and height of its bounding box. So, uh, you know, x and y might be the position of the top left corner. Oftentimes it's also, people actually use the position of the center of the bounding box, and the width and height are, are the width and height in pixels. These are all in image space, by the way, so so far we're not actually accounting for the fact that the scene is 3D. Uh, we could do that as well, and that's a, a fairly different problem setting, but for now everything is in image space, which means that all coordinates, widths, and heights are expressed in terms of pixels. All right, uh, now before we actually discuss methods, uh, we should talk a little bit about how we measure accuracy for localization. When we were doing object classification, it was pretty easy to measure accuracy because we could just say, um, well, you, you're correct if you got the right class, you're incorrect if you got the wrong class, and you want to know on what percentage of the images did you get the correct answer. When we are doing localization, we of course need to be a little more uh, detailed than that because we don't just want to know whether we got the correct class, we want to know that we got the bounding box in the right place. But of course, it doesn't have to be perfectly correct. Like if it's off by a few pixels, maybe that's good enough. So at a high level, our localization model will be some learned model that will take in a picture and it will output a semantic category and a bounding box. So maybe this model is not that good. It outputted this purple bounding box uh, and it got the class right. It said this is a cat. Okay, so it outputs five things, a class, an X, a Y, a W, and an H. Uh, all right, so, uh, and typically the class is associated with a score, like a probability. And then we want to say, well, was this a correct localization or not? Now, answering this question is really a matter of convention, because, you know, if you are actually using this system for some downstream application, like you actually want to get an autonomous car to drive, Ultimately, you don't care so much about whether the bounding box is in just the right spot. What you care about is whether the car successfully drove without getting into an accident. So in a sense, quantifying accuracy here is really more a, measure, a matter of convenience and convention. But it is important to have some convention so that if I tell you my model is this good, you'll actually understand what that means. Um, so a common convention in object localization as well as object detection is to use a measure called intersection over union. The intuition here is the following. We would like to say that the localization is correct if there's high overlap between the true bounding box in red and the predicted bounding box in purple. But if the object is larger, the area of the overlap will always be larger even if your bounding box is in the wrong spot. So if the object is tiny, uh, maybe you've got the bounding box in like almost the right spot, but it's a little bit off. Uh, but because it's so tiny, the actual area of the overlap is tiny. But if the cat takes up most of the image like it does here, if you were to just get the cat's you know, top left ear, maybe the overlap is actually just as large as if you had a tiny object. But of course, you don't want to get just the ear, you want to get the whole cat. Uh, so the idea in intersection over union is to basically quantify how much the boxes overlap while controlling for their absolute size. So intersection refers to literally the area of the intersection of the two bounding boxes. And union refers to the sum of the areas of the two bounding boxes. 
And intersection over union is literally just I divided by U. So the idea is that intersection over union uh, is always going to be between 0 and 1, because the intersection can never be larger than the union. And it's close to 1 if the intersection is close to the total area of the two bounding boxes. And it's close to 0 if the intersection is negligible. But it is not affected by the actual absolute size of the bounding boxes. So they could be tiny or they could be huge. That wouldn't really make a difference. So oftentimes we would calculate the intersection over union and then we would say that the localization is correct if we got the right class and the intersection over union is larger than some threshold. A common threshold is to say that it's larger than 0 0.5. Now, generally, if you're doing kind of standard computer vision benchmarks, the particular data set that you're using will have some protocol associated with it. Uh, so that it'll say, like, you know, for our data set, you should report correct if IOU is greater than 0 0.5. Or if you're using something like MS Coco, maybe they actually ask you to report uh, accuracy for different IOU values. So then you might report your accuracy at 0 0.5, at 0 0.7, and so on. All right, so that's the basic idea. Um, now, if uh, we are also outputting the class label, which is usually the case, we would say we're correct if the IOU is greater than 0 0.5 and the, the class is correct. Uh, now, uh, crucially, this is not a loss function. We don't actually train our network with respect to IOU. This is just an evaluation standard. It's a convention in the community that people use uh, to evaluate their models. We don't actually train with IOU because IOU is uh, difficult to optimize through. We train with other metrics, uh, which I'll discuss uh, a bit later. 